All right. Welcome in, everyone. Welcome in. Please, as you come in, would you please let us know in the chat who you are and where you're from? Great to see so many 9 to 12 AATSP members joining us this evening. Thanks for being here. Let's make sure everybody has access to actually. Um, not seeing anything in the chat, so I'm hopefully the chat is active. I'm I'm seeing some people introducing yeah. themselves. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sybil from Yale University and Alejandro saying hello from Santa Monica College. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have all regions represented. East Coast, West Coast, even Hawaii. Yay. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being interested in this topic. Um, Nick, we've got a comment yeah, in the chat. That I, I see that. I'm trying, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Actually, great. Um, okay, great. I'm not sure. Should have probably figured that out before. Um, well, the Q and A works, so. Ah, here we go. Now I see it. Sorry. There's so many options. You'd think after three years I knew how to I would know how to use this, right? Okay, there we go. Now everyone should be able to use the chat. Looks like it. Let's see. Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Oh. Oh now everyone's checking in. There we go. <laughs> also during this, you can always uh, hashtag this and Twitter at honoring languages as we go through today. We'll be doing some Twitter check-ins to see what kind of chatter is going on. All right, we got people from Montana, Rhode Island, Kentucky, I love, Hawaii. I love that. Medellin, Colombia. Oh, I know that Woo! guy. <laughs> Hawaii, ma'am. I wish I was in Hawaii. It's 40 degrees where I am right now, so I wish I was in Hawaii. <laughs> All right, so we'll Nick go ahead. And, 49 in Chicago. <laughs> not much different in Oregon. So we'll go ahead and get started and then I'll introduce everyone. So with us today, we have a, a great group of people who are going to chat a little bit about their experience with SELA by Literacy and, and how you can set up a program or expand programs you may have. So with us, we have Linda Egnantz, who is the executive director of the Global SEAL by Literacy, was also teacher of, actual teacher of the year. Um, I don't want to say former because I guess you're always a teacher. So um, not currently teaching teacher of Spanish and French at all levels. Um, and then we also have Lindsay Camacho from Illinois, and she will be speaking about her experience. Lisa McFadden from Alabama will be speaking about her experience. I'm Nick Gossett. I'll have a little bit. I'll talk about how uh, funding and some other things around the Seal by Literacy. We also have some group, uh, a group of people from both AATSP and the Heritage Language Exchange. Um, Erica from AATSP, uh, who is a, a secondary uh, board member for AATSP and has put this together with the uh, group uh, 9 to 12 in AATSP. Alejandro, Maria, and Sybil are all also a AATSP members, but are the ones that started the Heritage Language Exchange. So. We're really excited to have everyone here. We're excited that so many of you could join us. We are recording this. We will provide a link to the recording so that any of your colleagues who couldn't make it, you could share it with them. Uh, we will also have um, some information at the end that you can um, fill out a survey. And we will also be sending out 
some external materials tomorrow with the link to the webinar. So if you have anything, the chat does now work. I figured it out. We do have a Q&A. <laughs> so please don't hesitate to um, send your Q&A there and we'll do our best to answer. But we'll go ahead and get started. And we'll start with our first panelist, Linda Agnes. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this. I'm really excited. A um, longtime AATSP member here. So cheering all of you on. I very much miss uh, my Spanish language classroom. So as you can see, I'm the Global Steel of Biliteracy Executive Director. Um, but I've been working with the Seals of Biliteracy since 2012. Um, my school district in 2013 was the inaugural school district for the state of Illinois. Illinois was the first state to require a particular level of proficiency for and sort of set that um, example up. So I've worked with the Seals of Biliteracy, both the state and now the Global Seal of Biliteracy for over a decade. So I'm really excited to share and be able to answer any questions and be really a resource. But I want to highlight the hashtag here because this is going back to that first year when I realized that when you offer a credential or a seal of biliteracy, a recognition to students for language proficiency, not just being in your classroom, that they get excited. And that when students actually are tested and are given that feedback of where they are and the progress they've made on that proficiency pathway, they're excited. When you tell someone they're good at it, then you know they don't want to quit, and so that is sort of the how that hashtag was born. To by lit to quit. So when I when you are biliterate, when you have opportunity to use your language skills in real situations with real people, you don't want to stop. And that's really what we want to do. Um, and we want to talk about how we recognize that proficiency, but also how we keep it going. So with that, we'll move to my first slide. There we go. So I've, I've been doing some of uh, the regional conferences and this quote came from a student at the University of Oregon who when he received his global seal of biliteracy as a university student, he said, finally, a test that means something. And for students, oftentimes your course, because, you know, maybe it's the counselor's advice that they needed to take two years of a language to get into a university or a higher ed college program, that oftentimes they're not thinking about taking your class to acquire a language, they're taking your class to fulfill some sort of requirement. And means it, they're not necessarily invested in acquiring language proficiency. And so when you dangle that credit, that sort of carrot that says there's something else in it, something that students view and see as um, something for their future, something that is a payoff, then all of a sudden your students um, are more willing to take the next course. They're performing at a higher level because proficiency is the goal, not just getting a certain number of points um, or a test score. And so that concept was born out when we did a study um, of in, that was published in foreign language annals on um, the challenges and successes to the seals of biliteracy. And we looked at three different school districts, uh, large school districts, and all in different phases of implementation of the seals of biliteracy. And we did a lot of focus groups with students, um, students who had exited language programs, students who were still in language programs, students who were English language learners. And the students said in almost 80% of the time that they connected the benefit to having a seal of biliteracy with a career and their job future and their opportunities. They didn't even connect it with university or their better a better grade or some other kind of recognition, a scholarship. They really did see it as something valuable for their future. One of the students in the focus group said, it gives you a motive to finish. Before I was like, why am I in this class? And that's really what we want students to understand is the goal of our class is to acquire a lifelong skill. Next slide. So what do learners want? Well, according to all of those focus groups, according to a lot of the information that we've been seeing and using, learners want shareable recognition. In other words, they want to be recognized, they want it to be public if possible, but they want to further share that recognition, whether it's through social media, whether it's on a transcript, whether it's on a scholarship application, highlighting maybe on a common app, 
or looking at other ways to highlight their skills. The second thing that we've discovered is that universities and employers really like the seal of biliteracy in the sense that they want to be able to verify and measure language skills. And so one of the things about a proficiency rating is it comes in as it's been verified with a test and it measures skills so that they are students or potential uh, employees are also comparable. And so um, one of the things that, and click, just do a click there, Nick, that's been funny to sort of discover <laughs> is that in uh, study after study, and I found six different studies now, where the number one uh, thing people lie about on their resumes, their LinkedIn profiles, um, in a, on the job application, are their language skills. And we see this over and over again, because typically it's self identified, which means that it's not verified, it's not measured, and in it's not comparable because a student can, you know, well, I speak fill in the blank language. And if the employer can't speak that language or, you know, th then they're kind of, you know, they don't have a way to check it. And so these are three of the big pieces that we can see with seals of biliteracy is that it does create that sort of situation. Next slide. So one of the downsides of the seal of biliteracy has been our own language as language educators is in that we are calling it an award. It is awarded and it, it actually does fit the definition of an award, which is a prize, a recognition, it's given an honor of an achievement. But also an award is something that's given at the end of a program, it's given at the end of the race. And so if we provide an award or some sort of trophy that suggests you've reached the end, um, for most of our state seals of biliteracy, that's at intermediate mid. That's really the beginning of a language proficiency uh, journey as an independent language user. And we don't want to stop students there. We don't want them to make them feel like they've already arrived. And they are, in fact, all completely bilingual now. Really what they are is if we were in a sports situation, they would be sort of like JV and now they're able to sort of play on the, on the, on the team, but they've got a long way to go. And so what I'd, I'd like to do is change that nomenclature and start using the word credential because the global seal of biliteracy, a state seal of biliteracy, it still fits this description as well. It is an official document. It details a skill on the qualification. It details competence. And it was done by a third party. In other words, your school, your state, uh, the global seal, your university. And it was measured in most cases by a test. And a test is then proving those skills and those skills happen to be useful for the workplace. By providing micro-credentials, we're not only meeting the, um, the new trend in education, but we're also providing students with a way to leverage their language skills, not just applaud them for one um, night's program. And so what do our seals of biliteracy programs look like? Well, first we have our state seals of biliteracy. There are, as you can see here, 49 states that have some kind of a recognition program. To learn more about what is happening in your state, I've included a link here, theglobalseal.com. Um, under our resources tab, you'll find an interactive map that will take you directly to your state's information and your state's Department of Education website. For the most part, the state seals of biliteracy are awarded to high school seniors, oftentimes um, in those final award programs or at graduation, and it is based on language competency in English as well as another language, whether English is the first or the second language. When we see the state seals of biliteracy, that blue looks really exciting. But it is, um, it looks sort of like they all have that in common, but they are unique and different, just as our states are unique and different. And so the states will have different criteria, differences in terms of what tests have been approved. We have six states where seat time can earn a seal of biliteracy in that state. Also, not all of the states call their award, um, their program, a seal of biliteracy. We have some states that use the term endorsement. 
Uh, we have other states where it is um, a certificate. For example, in Indiana, it's a certificate of multilingual competency. And so we see different states um, using different ways of, of recognizing as well as different people who in different programs in terms of how the program is administered. There are some states where the student must apply directly to the state. We have other states where it's only public schools and private schools are excluded. And so each state is different. Um, and so you can kind of find out about your own particular state here. What's important for the state seals of biliteracy is we have 49 states who have said being bilingual, having a language other than just English is an asset. And that is the most important piece um, that we want to focus on is that's why we want to support state seals of biliteracy, because we want that to be important at a governmental level. So um, if you have a state seal of biliteracy program, go for it. The program that um, I am the executive director of was born from the state seal. So that, and it's called, we call it the global seal of biliteracy. So we're not affiliated with any um, state at all. It is, um, there we go. <laughs> um, in fact, um, it is really global. So you can see here, this is our current map. Um, that dark green indicates um, countries where the state, uh, the global seal of biliteracy has been issued by a university, um, by a school, by an employer, or by an organization. The Global Seal of Biliteracy um, had an opportunity, especially at the very beginning with a number of states who, when we were founded in 2018, still had not yet adopted a seal of biliteracy. Um, there were a number of private schools that were being left out. Uh, we had a number of universities asking for a way to provide their language learners with a certificate or document for work purposes. And so the Global Seal was born from those gaps and continues to grow. We um, certify at three different levels. Um, we start at that intermediate mid-level, move to um, uh, the advanced low level, and then to advanced high. And we do that in 130 different languages on both the ACTFL as well as the CEFR or the Common European Framework of Reference Proficiency Scales. Um, so you'll see the certificate here. Uh, we also offer pathway award ribbons for those students that are on their way. So next slide. One of the things that we wanted to do was to provide students with not just that sort of identification and recognition of their language proficiency, but also a way to share that. In other words, how will they leverage their skills? How will they be able to articulate their language skills for their next steps, whether that is working with an NGO or attending, continuing their language journey at the university level or, or applying for a job? And so one of the exciting things that we are working with is what we call a language profile, which is a way for students to digitally share their language skills. It actually is a digital copy of um, image of their own certificate, which is serial numbered. And it provides a description of what that means in workplace terms. What is that level of proficiency able to do? And I think if you click the slide, you'll see another image here. So whether those students, for example, these CIEE students who have earned their global seals after a study abroad, or for example, this per, um, an individual uh, working with the sheriff's department who wanted to articulate their language journey. And so in addition to being able to share your digital uh, credential, to define it and explain it to a non-language person, there's also this language journey, which is really just an open space where someone could list courses, describe how they're using language in the workplace, describe a study abroad opportunity, or in some other way, maybe share their identity as a heritage language learner and what language means to them. Next slide. And so what we learned from all of the data, from the incredible growth, we see an advanced placement, um, Spanish language, French language, Chinese language. We see these programs doubling after a couple of years of having a seal of biliteracy program. Students no longer take the course to fulfill that requirement. They're taking the course to get a seal of biliteracy. So from the beginning, they have their eye on a four-year sequence or longer. And so that's one of our goals is really to lengthen those sequences 
courses. So learners actually have an opportunity to become proficient. So we see students earning the state seals of biliteracy. Certainly we see them with the global seal of biliteracy. And I think really for the very exciting piece, we like it when students, as this student here, um, earned his seal of biliteracy in both as a state and a global. And so no student ever turned down a certificate or an award that they could use to highlight their skills. So it's really adding to their opportunities in terms of how they might leverage or use their language skills and their certificates in the future. And depending upon your state level, if you're a state, for example, at intermediate mid, you one test, one score um, can earn both the intermediate mid level of your state seal, as well as the global seal at the functional fluency level, which is intermediate mid. If you're in a state in Illinois, like I am, where we have intermediate high, then you can really use the state and global seal as a benchmarked um, sort of scaffolded award program. So it's really gamification. So your, your uh, heritage learners, your students who are more advanced, who have started maybe in a dual language immersion program, can begin earlier, maybe in middle school, at the end of eighth grade, maybe in freshman or sophomore, earn a functional fluency level of certification certificate with a global seal, then move on to a state seal of biliteracy. And then if they're, you know, continuing in their language programs and the, the, in those advanced placement programs, or if they've had some really cool experiences, maybe a study abroad, working toward that working fluency at advanced low and then even beyond. We want our students to continue these language sequences into the university level. Next slide. So educators, there's lots of you on this call and you can also get Global Seal certified. Um, this is an, um, Angelo Villarreal, he's in New Jersey and he said, as an adult and as an educator, we lead the example. And so as a if you want your students to believe language is important, certify it. We want every employer to say, do you have a seal of biliteracy? And to do that, we want to start setting the example. So first of all, begin setting the example and adding your own Global Seal Certified to your um, email signature. Uh, things that, uh, what we want to do is we want to bring visibility to the fact that language can be measured and validated and that, that it's important to do that. The second thing is by taking a seal, a test that would qualify you for a seal of biliteracy, you begin to have the same experience your students have. And teachers who have done this tell us that it really helped them prepare their own students. And some teachers said it was a real aha moment because what they discovered is, yes, they're listening, they're, maybe they're reading, and maybe even they're speaking were well into the advanced ranges but maybe they hadn't been writing academically in the language they were teaching. So, you know, one teacher said, well, I realized that I just mostly write open-ended prompts and muy bien at the top of a test <laughs> and had not done academic length writing herself in a long time. And so this is one way to recognize teachers in your district. We have uh, districts where all of the teachers are encouraged to be Global SEAL certified, and you can add it um, because of that unique serial number on the Global SEAL to a LinkedIn profile. In my state of Illinois, the Global SEAL of Biliteracy at our working and professional levels of fluency is a test proxy for um, teacher certification um, with the Illinois State Board of Education. So we're really looking at um, a, a job credential that your students could earn and be already on their way to filling our teacher pipeline for those much needed uh, language educators we're going to be needing in the future. Next slide. So students do benefit from a seal of biliteracy. They benefit in lots of different ways. Um, if they earn a global seal, they can earn that before their senior year and use that um, as they're applying for universities or for colleges. But they can add it to job applications, scholarship programs, certainly advanced placement because they're coming in with a verified level of proficiency and that's going to make it easier for college university placement. Um, in my state of Illinois, um, universities were tasked with aligning their coursework with an actual proficiency level to make placement of these students easier. It might be surprising to those of you that are um, at the university and the higher education level on this webinar that there are over that in our last state seal of biliteracy report, we had over 100,000 students at intermediate mid 
and beyond. So those are students that you could incorporate into your advanced language programs, so your higher level programs. Um, and you know they can become majors and minors, but you need to identify them and you need uh, to, um, to make it enticing to choose your university. And so these are all great uh, reasons, but sometimes students are a little hesitant. They're not sure if they're, they're in the ballpark for a test. And so really a quick thing to do is to provide them with this free self-assessment um, it's got six little mini quizzes and it'll give them an approximation of their language skills based on the actual can do's. And I think my next slide is the last one. Here we go. Oh, just at the very end here, there are four states that provide uh, college credit for SEALs of Biliteracy and the Global SEAL. And I think Nick's going to talk about that a little bit more, but we're working with universities to provide pathways to college credit. So I have, I think that's my last piece here. That's it. Yeah. Lindsay's yep. gonna there we are. And we go to Lindsay. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so I will be the first of the two high school teachers talking about how we've managed to incorporate or expand SEAL Bioliteracy programs in our school. Um, and I will be specifically talking about the Illinois State SEAL Bioliteracy and how that applies. Um, and I teach at Glenbrook South High School, which is in suburban Chicago. Um, and if Nick would go to the next slide, I'll just give you a very brief little profile about my school. Um, I saw some of you in the chat were asking about if the seal of biliteracy testing is only for heritage language speakers or if it's for everyone. Um, we have, we are now up to 7% of English language learners in our school. And that doesn't even include all of the students who speak another language at home that are not technically EL students. Um, we have a large population of Mongolian speakers, as well as Spanish, Korean, Polish, Russian, Greek, Urdu, Malayalam, Bulgarian, Romanian, Mandarin, but there's others, there's Serbian, there's all kinds of other languages represented at our school as well. Um, in our world language department, we have a five-year sequence for um, Spanish, French, Chinese, Japanese, German, um, including AP language and Spanish literature programs. Uh, we also have a Spanish for Heritage Learner program that feeds into um, our AP language and AP literature courses. Um, we do not have, we actually have had, you'll see in my slides about our testing data, I see there's a question about Portuguese. We have a couple of students that are heritage speakers of Portuguese that have tested at my in my district, but we don't offer um, a Portuguese language option at my school. Uh, we also offer an American Sign Language program, which is another language in Illinois that can qualify for a seal of biliteracy. Um, and Nick, if you will, I'm sorry, I was just about to advance for myself. Nick, Nick if you would be so kind for me. Um, so here is, there's, I know there's a lot of data here, which I know is not, I, I've presented, I swear I've presented before, and I know I'm not supposed to have this much text, but I also know that you guys are going to have questions, and I thought this might help. Um, so as, you know, both Linda and Nick have mentioned, Illinois State Board of Ed requires intermediate high, which would be considered a stamp uh, level six on four skills of the stamp test. We also test in ALTA, which would be a one plus on the three skills of ALTA for uh, our less commonly taught languages. So for many years, and I saw some of you were saying that you were only testing in the languages you taught at your school. To me, that's the perfect way to start your seal of biliteracy program. Um, I imagine probably that's how many of our programs started. Um, and that is what we did for several years before we opened it up to other, and even then we only opened it up to other stamp languages. So it was like, okay, we'll test in Russian and Hebrew and Polish, but we're not going to open it up to anything else. Well, finally, we had a big push from our Mongolian and Ukrainian students and the Alta came around as well. So Alta and the um, SLPI ASL have also been added this year. Um, as far as how we administer testing, I know this is a lot of like gritty details here, but we basically do two Saturday mornings in the fall and two Saturday mornings in the spring. Um, and we generally get about a hundred testers during each session. And of course this doesn't even include, um, you know, our, all of our AP language students, which also AP is also of course a way to qualify for the SEAL by literacy in Illinois. Um, we only do the ALTA testing in the fall because for the ALTA testing, they have to do a phone interview one-on-one. -on -one, which is a lot of um, intensive scheduling to be handled, but we had 37 students test in 11 different languages this fall. Um, so there was obviously a big demand for all of these languages here. Um, and then a new thing that we started this year, which has been, I think, very interesting. You know, Linda was talking so much about benchmark testing. We had our French five and five honors take a stamp during their class in late January, early February. 
um, which I think is an excellent opportunity for our non AP track students to have their language skills evaluated. One of them even did qualify is intermediate high in all four skills and qualified for a seal of literacy. The almost all of the rest qualified for accommodation, which is I think what we would hope to see in our level five students. Um, and then just oh, the last week or two, we've had all of our Spanish four non honors students testing we've had uh, 250 of our Spanish four students take stamps in the last two weeks. So I am up to about here with <laughs> stamp results and reports coming at me. Um, but you know the data is still coming out but it's been pretty i would say pretty promising we would say most of our students are at the intermediate range in all four skills which is what again we hope to see in level four students um, and then our asl4 students which was only probably what 12 or 15 students took our slpi test the last week of february we are still waiting on those results as well but we're just trying to um you know as, as linda was mentioning these are really good targets for students to number one, feel some success. Cause I think a lot of times my, I teach Spanish three and Spanish four honors. My Spanish three kids think they can't do anything. My Spanish four kids are pretty confident with what they can do. So I think it's a really great way to build confidence in those non-honors students. Um, I see that there's a question in the chat about funding, which is a great question. So for our students who tested during class, the fees for testing were built into their student fees. So our students at our school don't, they don't buy like textbooks. There's like a student ma instructional materials fee, they call it, that every student pays and it's a flat fee for every student. So they were able to roll in the cost of this, you know, that stamp $20, $25-ish. Um, they were able to roll that cost into each student's individual fees for the year. Um, so I think that's a nice way for, again, for our non-honors, non-AP track students to have their skills. And also we had a kid who was in Spanish four, they took a stamp in October and qualified at intermediate high and advanced low in all four skills. And we were like, guess what? You're taking AP Spanish next year, congratulations. So it's kind of a cool way too, to find out those kids that have been like, kind of, you know, underachieving or like keeping it low key and sort of encourage them to take the next step and challenge themselves a little more. Um, Nick, if you will continue on for me here. Um, just since we've talked about it so much and since so many of you have, have had questions in the chat about the seal of biliteracy and how you can qualify, what's the difference between the seal and AP? Well, AP is a test that can qualify you for a seal. AP is an assessment, just like the stamp or the apple or the Ulta or whatever else. Um, and, you know, there's a number of different assessments that you can use, evaluations that you can use to qualify for seal by literacy. Um, and as we said, Illinois is maybe one of the higher requirement, Linda, you would know better than me, one of the higher requirement states, right, with an intermediate high. Although I just discovered today when I was doing some research for the um, webinar tonight, I didn't know this, that you can also use Illinois Friends, a composite score of six on the stamp to qualify for a seal of biliteracy. So when you have some kids that are getting some seven and eights on certain subtests and maybe a five on the speaking, but you've got a composite of six or 6.25 or 6.5. So that was part of my distraction today was I was having to go back through my old data and see who could now qualify for a seal of biliteracy with this wonderful information. Um, and then, if you would, Nick, go to the next slide, it just talks about in Illinois, we also have a commendation towards biliteracy. And I know Linda had mentioned a little bit about students getting an intermediate. Um, Nick, could you go back one really quickly? Uh, yeah. There we go. The commendation, Illinois also awards a commendation towards biliteracy for students that have achieved intermediate low or better in all four subtests. So the reason I bring this up is simply because I don't know if your state does the same thing. Um, and because for our Spanish four students, again, non-honors track, uh, almost all of them are here. Almost all of them are showing stamp four or better in all four skills. And this is now going to qualify them for an Illinois state commendation towards biliteracy, which some Illinois public universities will also recognize with college credit. Um, so in Illinois, Per Illinois law, as Linda also mentioned on her slide, Illinois is one of the, what, is it four states, four or five states um, that is required by law to give um, university credit at public state universities. Um, oh, and Linda's saying that Illinois is the only state with accommodation. Is that interesting? Hmm. 
Um, okay, and then Nick, if you will carry on, if you don't mind here, I have just some of our data here. Um, again, for the uh, the people that are in the chat asking about languages, again, you can look at these here. These are not all languages taught at our school. Obviously, we have Spanish, French, German, Japanese, Chinese. This one, Spanish, French, German, Chinese, Japanese. I believe those are the ones that we have, like for AP. Um, and then the rest of these are, you know, students that have outside um, language skills from home. Um, yeah, and so again, in 2023, we're seeing already in a large number, we've already got 100 seals so far, and that doesn't, of course, even include all of our seniors that are currently enrolled in an AP language course. Illinois does allow for students to get a seal by literacy after graduation, provided that they've taken the assessment while they were still enrolled in the high school. So we as you know, Linda and I were talking yesterday, it's sort of anticlimactic because we send it by the mail in like August and a lot of them have already left for college. It's not as exciting as when you get the beautiful seal on your diploma. However, it still counts for them and it still goes on there retroactively. They'll retroactively update their um, diplomas as well or their transcripts rather. Um, all right, let's see what we've got next here. Um, so I made this infographic and Erica asked that I <laughs> include it on here. Um, I love Canva. And Illinois, as, as we've said, Illinois is a state that requires students to earn um, university credit if they go to an Illinois state university and they've earned a state seal of biliteracy. So you can see some universities are extremely generous. Um, you know, we've got SIU Edwardsville, Northern Illinois University, which is not too far away from, you know, where we're teaching over here, um, as well as our, you know, community colleges, our, you know, flagship university, the University of Illinois will award eight credits. And my um, constant reminder to students is always to keep their score report, whether it's for the ALTA, for the stamp, keep that score report because you may be able to get university credit regardless. And um, Nick is gonna talk a little bit more about that later as well. Um, and I don't know if that might be it for me. Yeah, yeah. so we're going to have a Twitter check-in right now. See if we have anybody hashtag honoring language. Eric, have you seen anything? That is empty, but the chat on the webinar is blowing up. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm trying to keep up with the chat on the webinar. So we appreciate all these great questions. All right, then we'll continue with someone from my home state. Lisa yes. McFadden. We actually went to the same university, Lisa. We so. did. We did. South Alabama. Love That's it. That's right. Yes. Well, my story is is very similar um, to Lindsay's in the in the sense that um, Nick, if you'll go to the next slide, if you don't mind. As far as kind of the structure of our school, we are a suburb suburban high school. We're not quite as large. Um, our community um, has uh, just one high school in our school system, um, but we do offer a variety of different languages where students can, you know, obviously begin their language journey um, from American Sign Language, which is recently within the last three or four years we've added. Um, we have French levels one through five plus AP. Um, our students can begin their language study in the middle school level at seventh or eighth grade, depending for three of the languages, French, German, and Spanish. Our Latin and American Sign Language, they have to wait till they're actually at the high school level because we don't have staffing or the numbers to be able to um, have those languages there. Um, we actually started our seal of biliteracy program back in 2017 um, as a pilot for the state of Alabama because um, there was the state of Alabama has no foreign language requirement to graduate. So to promote our programs and to, you know, be able to motivate our students and give validity to what they're doing, um, our, our our school board was like, okay, go for it. And um, it took a little bit of convincing, but if you will take the initiative and talk to your school boards initially, um, then you will find that the buy-in comes pretty quickly many times. Um, at least that's what we experienced, which was nice. And 
Since we started um, in 2017, we've served over um, 1,500 um, students. Um, now, not that many have received the seal of bioliteracy, but it has been an opportunity for students to stay in our programs and to continue on, um, which has been huge. We have added approximately three new teachers to our programs because um, as you can see, we have levels one through five. Well, we have added a, a level four there. Previously, we were just levels one, two, three, and it went straight to AP. But then we realized that some of our students were obviously not necessarily AP students, but they still had a love of language and wanted to continue to study. So we were able to expand our programs there. Um, uh, let's see. We have had uh, so uh, quite a bit of success with it, but our our level um, is not intermediate high. It is intermediate mid is what we require um, in the state of Alabama. And I want to point out that the state of Alabama just recently adopted a state seal. Um, actually, I don't think anyone has actually applied for it yet. Um, what we did was we created our own seal at our within our district and then started partnering with Global Seal of Biliteracy. And we have used that over the last three years um, to help drive our program. And that's uh, it has been a wonderful, wonderful gift for our students. Um, next slide, please. Here are a few of the requirements for the state of Alabama, and just to compare a little bit to um, what we have, um, what Lindsay was talking about before, um, we obviously English proficiency is required there, and they have a couple of different pathways. They can either have an 18 on the ACT in English or a 20 on the reading. Um, um, the, you have your WIDA scores for your ELL students as well as the Apple ESL of I-4 or higher. Um, we do not require um, seat time or grade point averages for the English, um, but um, the ACT scores and the WIDA are what of the, ma the main um, English uh, qualifications that have to be met. And then, of course, for our other language, we use the stamp primarily. We have used other assessments previously, but we found that um, the stamp is really helpful for us because it allows the students us to show where the students are uh, on the proficiency scale a little more effectively, which has been nice. Um, if for our Latin students, we um, use the Lyra test, although we're looking into you know other options as well. Um, and then we have used the Slippy um, as well for the ASL um, portion of for our students there, and as well as the um, AP exam, which we've now um, our AP um, courses are primarily for seniors, so that is not something that is used as as much because it's hard for us to award the seal after students graduate and those scores come back in July. So what we have been focusing on mainly is using our stamp assessments for those certifications. Next slide, please. Um, we typically will award the seal of biliteracy to students their senior year, but we actually start the assessment process in their third year of language study. Um, we use it as a benchmark because we know a lot of the students may not act actually be ready or be there at that point in time, but it is a wonderful motivation um, because the students, you know, whenever they get feedback from us as their teachers, they're like, of course, you're going to tell me I'm doing a good job. Of course, you're going to tell me, you know, I'm capable. But whenever they have an outside validation and then they see on their stamp score, oh, my goodness, you know, I've been studying for three years and I'm already at this level as a non-native speaker it really encourages them to continue on. Um, for our kind of organizational um, peace of mind, <laughs> uh, that is the reason why we wait until their senior year to, to actually do the formal awarding. The students know that they have it, that they've achieved it, and so they can include it on resumes as well as college applications that they would like. Um, but the formal uh, presentation of awards and the certificates is, is reserved for their senior year. Um, now, the where, where they get it, they obviously have certificates um, for the state of Alabama. It is supposed to go on their transcript as well as um, added into uh, on their diploma when they graduate. But that is still in process now. Uh, next slide, please. 
This gives you a little bit of an idea of our growth from the time when we first started in 2017. Um, we had, you know, started out with 79 applicants um, for the program, and then in, we just had our last drive. We try to um, correspond our registration process and our sign-up time for Seal of Biliteracy there at the same time, so that if a student is questioning whether they should continue on or not, it's like, well, of course you want to apply for the Seal of Biliteracy, and if you're going to be applying for the Seal of Biliteracy, you need to remain in the program and continue on um, with your studies, and it has helped immensely in our retention rate. Um, the class sizes, we the applicants, it's divided according to uh, graduation year and um, our students for the 2024, we have already had 232 students apply and we open application each year. Um, one thing that has been beneficial for us is we start the application process at the end of year two of their studies. So that's a lot of times, you know, you're one and done or two and out because that's what most colleges and universities are looking at. Or, you know, in other school systems, there may be um, a world language requirement, which, of course, in Alabama, there's not. But it does help um, the students stay focused on what um, their ultimate goal is, is, is to learn and be proficient in the language. Um, next slide, please. And this is just um, a link on our page, just kind of an overview of a few more details on how our program is set up, if anyone is interested in it. Um, if I had any advice to give to anyone, it would be just to go for it, to give it a try, start small, um, and, you know, don't look for help as far as collaborating with your other stakeholders, whether it be, um, you know, your administration, your guidance counselors, and, uh, of course, your other faculty members. So, that's about all that I have. So if anybody has any questions, I'm totally game. Perfect. Let's do another Twitter chat check in. Oh, or we're just going to go crazy, I guess. <laughs> there we go. Erica, do you have anything? I'm not seeing anything for hashtag too well to quit or uh, hashtag honoring languages, um, but if anybody wants to put things here um, in the chat or the Q and A, keep it keep it up. It's great. I love the enthusiasm. I love the interest. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about a couple of things here. Some of it funding, some of it, some other initiatives that are going on as far as pathways and ways that students can get credit going into higher ed. So um, my information's here if you want to reach out to me, um, but different places to find funding. There are some districts that their district or their school budget will cover this. I know not everyone comes from a district like that, but I'm just giving you all the options here. There could be an option with PTA, um, depending on some states. Uh, you know, like when I was living in Alabama, the PTA had to raise money to even have a language teacher or a music teacher. We had to pay their salary through fundraising because they were not um, valued by the people that made the, the money decisions in our district. So there could be some opportunities there. There are local organizations, possibly like the Hispanic Business Association or various associations like that, uh, that are local in communities that may be willing to fund things like this for a couple of reasons. It's a good PR piece for them, to be honest. It's also organizations like the Lions Club, the Rotary Club, they have the mission of internationalization. So they may be willing to throw in some money there. These are places that maybe these kids' grandparents or your you know, colleagues may be members of. There are some states that do have grants out there. Um, I know there are states that have been able to um, use Title III funds in a very specific way because of the ELL connected to it and working with students like that in some states. So that is a that is an option. There are federal grants out there now. The Wallara Act, W-L-A-R-A, -A, is something that people sleep on because they see it's for the Department of Defense and they don't think that they qualify. The qualification is that a minimum of 10% of your students have parents in the military. There are many schools that are not on a military base or close to a military base where they have 10% of their student body 
whose parents are in the military. You can apply for that grant and they can be up to five years and they're giving out millions of dollars a year, a year and only about 15 grants were given in the last year. And I know they're willing to give more money. So this is a great option to go out there. The grants are open now. They're due soon in April. So you might want to get with your team and get that going. Uh, there's also some stuff that's coming through that Linda may want to post some links to that were, if you're in involved in advocacy in your state org and they're a member of JNCL, there are things that are being pushed like the BEST Act, which would specifically provide funding to help fund and set up biliteracy seal programs in schools and districts. So there's there's funding currently out there. There's currently, currently there's funding coming out. You just kind of have to Keep your, you know, keep your ear to the ground there on that one. And of course, we're, as soon as we hear about things, we will share out to the groups. State language organizations in some states have in the past paid for CELA by literacy days where they'll pay for students to test. Um, if you're on a state org board, maybe bring it up. Um, that's something that many of them are 501Cs, so they can get that uh, you can take that money from donors and you can put that towards various things. And so funding a SEAL kind of testing event through your state org could be an option for areas where maybe there's not large schools or there's a lot of rural areas or anything like that. Washington State has done that in the past um, and that it's been rather successful. National language organizations do have agreements with various testing companies that you can have a discount on testing that makes it more affordable. If you're an AATSP member, you can get a test for $19.90 for your student to test for the Global Seal of Bioliteracy um, in both Spanish and Portuguese. If you have any colleagues who are AATG members, they can also get a discount through AATG membership. But you got to make sure your AATSP membership is up to date. So make sure you and your friends get that membership renewed. University and colleges, there are some that have started to offer these CELA by literacy testing days because they can throw in a couple of thousand dollars. And if they can use that to recruit students to their program, if they recruit one or two students, they've made their money back. So it's an opportunity. University of Nebraska Kearney does this. There are a number of universities that are talking about doing this, but they need to hear from you, the high school groups saying yes, we need you to help us with this. It's a way for you to bring, we'll bring our students to campus, you test them, and you can directly recruit them into your programs. Again, I'm going to mention the Wallara Department of Defense grant. Again, only 10% of your student population must be children of the military. So you might want to look at that. Someone in your district can pull that data for you. I guarantee you they have that data somewhere because it's, it's typically something they look at. Some other things we're working on is these pathways. Um, universities and colleges in a number of states are accepting state and global seals, uh, the ones that are test-based at least, for credit and or advanced placement. So this is an opportunity for your students to go in, take their test scores or their global or state seal, get in some cases up to 14 credit hours as they go into college. So some states, four states, require it's required by law for their state institutions. But we're starting to see other states and other institutions, even private schools, to set these pathways up because what they want is those students coming to their language programs at those higher levels that you guys are sending them out with. And that benefits their programs because they can grow them at the top, at the top where it actually matters to, to the administration. There are relationships between schools and districts of higher education. I'll show you one in a second that we recently set up between UT Arlington and the Dallas Metroplex area, where students who have a test uh, at a certain level or a global seal that is test-based go to the university. They will place them into a class and give them retroactive credit after they take that class, up to 14 credit hours. If they take that class, two more classes, they get a minor. So a student can go into the university, get 14 credit hours, get a minor, and they can do another major on top of that to add that language skill to whatever they want to do in their life. And we're finding that these are not just beneficial for the students, but the language programs and institutions. So they're willing to do this. I talk to five institutions a week who are like, how do we set this up? We want to do this because we need these students in our programs. We miss these students when they come in for advising or admissions because 
the advisors say, well, you've already taken this, you don't need to do any more. But those students may want to continue. And a lot of institutions are adding specific purpose programs. That's the fastest growing part of language right now is specific purpose. So there's programs in criminal justice, business, uh, some programs I work with at SMU are doing like fashion design in French. You know, some really cool programs out there that our students really could benefit from and jump in their freshman year. So this is the one example I want to show you that I can also drop into that resource folder from the University of Texas at Arlington. I want you to take this to your local universities that your students feed into and say, you need to do this. Since we released this within one week of releasing this to the Dallas school districts, 12 of them had contacted the university to figure out how they could get their students into these programs, get them into these classes so they can get that retroactive credit in seven different languages. So it's a great growth tool for both the higher ed, but also your high school students, because maybe they'll stay in that language longer if they know that going into college, that's credit hours that mom and dad don't have to pay for. That's credit hours that I don't have to take a loan out for and be saddled with debt. That's a program I can jump into and get a minor in a year or a major in two years, and I get to study abroad. So it's all the things we tell them when we're teaching them and we want them to continue, it benefits high school programs and it benefits higher ed programs, but it also benefits that student because then we're setting them up for success and to be those lifelong learners. So they go out there and we have a more multilingual workforce. Just one more thing I'll mention about uh, our stamp test, it is ACE, the American Council on Education, certified and recommended for credit. So a student could take their test scores to an institution. It's just like the AP, the institution will decide on whether or not they will accept it, and they will decide on how many credit hours they're willing to give. This is just a recommendation. Over 2,000 universities uh, are members of ACE, but that doesn't mean that they'll necessarily take it without first reviewing it with their language department. But that is something that makes the test even more valuable for a student. Uh, we do know University of Maryland and University of Washington both have accepted these for credit for students. So there are opportunities for students to actually take, actually the student was from Chicago, went to school at Maryland. And so they were able to jump into a minor because the university gave them credit enough to place out of the first couple of years of language. So, Let's do one last Twitter check-in before we get to any other burning questions. And I know I breezed through that, but I want to make sure we stay in time. So, Eric, we have anything? Yeah, we do. Finally, Profe Leroy, uh, Senor Salazar asked um, a question, if multilingual students can speak a global uh, seal if they speak other languages at home that aren't offered at their current school. And so, yeah, we we replied, absolutely, absolutely. We're, that's the... The objective today, honoring those home languages in addition to recognizing skills that we're developing in our classrooms. Thank you for your question, Prof. Leroy. Absolutely. We appreciate it. We love getting those questions. We want to give those students credentials for any language they can speak, home language, language they learn, however they learned it. We want to make sure we recognize those students. All right. So, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll put in some last things. We'll be here for questions. So please stay around if you have questions, but there will, there is a survey uh, that we'd love for you to take. Here's a, a number of links. Again, we will send out this recording plus the slides in an email tomorrow. So please don't worry if you didn't take enough screenshots or you weren't able to, to write down things fast enough. We will make sure that you have all of this information. Um, any, any questions that you'd like to ask? I know that it's only in chat, but we can read them aloud and answer them as well. Or any other comments that or thoughts that came up from the other panelists during uh, the other parts of the presentation, Linda, Erica, uh, Lisa, Lindsay, anything that came to mind? Um, I do wanna just say that I just got a question in the Q and A, which is definitely a Linda question. Um, somebody had asked if the um, Apple test would qualify students for a global seal of biliteracy. Yes, um, the Apple test qualifies at an I-4 for our functional fluency. Um, and if it's in the A range, um, um, but we do, it's the, it would be the Apple form uh, B, so not form A, but form B. Um, and in the A range could qualify for our uh, advanced low working fluency certificate. So yes, it does. And I will get um, 
I will get my colleague to change the permission on that survey because it seems like it's locked. So I will take care of that. I do apologize for that. Um, we will take care of that. All right. I saw another question that was posted. It was asking if you could get both your state seal and global seal of biliteracy. I know for our school system, whenever our students make their application for the seal of biliteracy, it is for both, you know, our local as well as for global, um, because our guidelines are in line with the qualifications that global uh, seal of literacy has for functional level. And so we use one application and then we use the test scores to, you know, to qualify our students for both the, our local, either state or, or regional one for our school um, or the global seal. And I would yeah. say you want to stack those credentials because mm -hmm. If a student leaves the state, that state that state seal may not be recognized by another state because someone pointed out that every state seems to have different qualifications. Mm -hmm. That global seal, though, is not only global in the sense that it's global around the world, <laughs> but also that it has that one agreed upon level. And I won't speak for Linda, but that, that's probably what she was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was also just going to say that it's important to support a state seal if you can, not all schools. And certainly, you know, if you're in higher ed or middle school, you're not able to do that. Um, and you also could lose the opportunity to benchmark test. Um, I think that's really, really important. So if a student can earn a global seal earlier than a state seal, go for it and then continue to dangle the credit to level up their proficiency. You want to you wanna recognize when the student is performing well. So I think that sort of celebrate what you want to duplicate is really, really important. So I think, you know, that's a piece, but we have lots of schools that use both programs. It's one test and you can get two different benefits. So no student will complain about that. <laughs> and the global seal is free. There's no cost yes. at all. Like and that, is, that has been wonderful, I know, for our kids. And, uh, you know, like Linda was saying about the benchmark, it has really encouraged those kids that were at functional fluency instead of saying, OK, well, I've achieved our seal of biliteracy. I'm, I'm done now. Now they are saying, wait a minute, if I have a seven here, then maybe I can push towards working fluency. Let me reassess. When are we doing reassessment? Um, and I, I noticed that, um, Lindsay, you guys do some of your testing on the weekend which is a great idea. Um, I know for our school, we're getting ready on um, March 21st to do our first round. We divide it into Spanish, which is our largest group, and our seniors who are doing their last round of assessment, they go first. Um, and then we have another set that comes in April. Um, but we do, we've done it during the school day and we call it our ACT testing day, but it's for world languages. Um, and so that has worked out um, pretty well um, for our students. This is our second year trying it that way. We used to do that, but unfortunately our enrollment has gone up and up and up and up and there's no space left in the building anymore. So we were, you know, but COVID we had to do it because of space constraints. And now it's just been the reality due to an overcrowded building. So I completely understand. It's hard though. Cause like you said, for some kids, it is hard if they've got Saturday Polish school or they've got a job or they've got sports, it's not ideal, but it's, we do the best we adult, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, we have a question in the chat here. I don't know if anyone is in here from New Jersey that's had any success in implementing a program, but uh, Marianne was saying that she tried to get info, but the person she was contacting didn't follow up. And Marianne, let me tell you, I've had a very similar experience working with Illinois State Board of Ed and trying to get in touch with people from the um, ELL and biliteracy department. It's sometimes it would be two months before I could get an email back. And I wish I were exaggerating here. Um, so I don't know if anyone else is able to chat back to Marianne that's had success in New Jersey with contacting anyone or setting up a program at their school. Um, sometimes you really have to nag. I, I hate to say it, but you have to just be really persistent and keep following up until you get someone to give you answers. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Well, I'd like to thank all of the panelists, um, I'd like to thank Lisa, Lindsay, and, and Linda for your time. Sorry, all those LIs kind of almost got it mixed up. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. I want to thank Erica, Maria, Sybil, and Alejandro for having this idea and putting this panel together. It's, I think it's a very important topic. 
you know, it, you know, as language teachers, you know, we have to stick together and work together. And so please lean on the resources here and your other colleagues to help set up these biliteracy, seals of biliteracy program, because they do benefit the students and they do, as you've seen here, can benefit your program as well. Um, I'm sure Lisa and Lindsay would be happy to answer any questions if you reach out to them. Um, they did provide their email address, so they opened themselves up for that. So I'm sure they'd be happy to provide any answers or any kind of just, you know, sometimes you just need to hear someone to listen to you and some support. I'm sure they'd be willing to do that. So we really appreciate it. Um, if there's nothing else, then I'll go ahead and let everybody go because I know it is about 9 p.m. on the East Coast. So I want every, hope everyone has a great evening and please look out for an email you'll receive from us. We will make sure that that um, survey is open for you, but we also will send an email tomorrow that has a number of the resources we showed today, as well as a recording to this. So you can send it to other teachers. If you want an administrator to look at it, please do that and share as far as you can. Thank you again. Uh, and we hope to see you in our next webinar. <laughs> that that was pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good job, guys. Great job. Thank y'all. Thank y'all for organizing everything that y'all made it so easy. <laughs> you were you were multitasking. Everybody was answering everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was good it was well attended so yeah it's awesome it's i awesome. really appreciate y'all's time on this i, I know it's it's a lot it's, yeah, a lot going on right now you know <laughs> always but yeah it's good i think it was good you know i think it's people need to hear some of these things because for them it seems like a, a an enormously daunting task so mm -hmm. You know, so. And if they just take the first little step, I know it's it is nerve wracking, but you can start small and then watch it build, figure it out, and then you know hopefully people will reach out and we can kind of share what we've learned, you know, along the way, the successes and the like. Mm, we will not do that that way again. <laughs> that did not work so well. Well, and and Lisa, 